So let's get started. Um, I am super excited today to welcome uh, Brent, an absolute rock star um, with uh, an accelerated career in finance. Overview of how today's going to go. We'll cover a range of topics from questions that you guys have sent, sent out around career planning, finance and work on the job, recruiting, networking, resumes, interviews, and then finally succeeding out. So let's get started. All right, Brent. So I'll have you kind of walk through quickly or you know go through your background and what brings you to the, here today and kind of some of the some of the decision points around kind of where you end up uh, and, and how that helps. Sure. Um, so hi everyone, Brent Smallwood. Thanks for the introduction. I'm excited to be here today talking to all of you. Um, I am currently a principal on investment bank getting at Center View Partners. Uh, for those of you who don't know Center View, it is a smaller boutique uh, investment bank. We focus across all industries, more kind of a generalist focus, and we have offices pretty much around the world. Um, I cover mostly financial institutions. I actually met Kaushik years ago when we worked together at Goldman Sachs in the financial institutions group doing investment banking. So um, I've done banking now for about seven years. I did about five at Goldman, um, and, then, and then I've been at Center Group for a little over two. Um, while I was at Goldman, I also spent a year doing uh, kind of an internal mobility rotation, helping to start their new consumer and commercial lending division. Uh, for those of you who have heard of Marcus by Goldman Sachs, the deposit and loan and uh, Apple Card and some of those types of things, I was uh, helping to start that while I was there as well. Um, yeah, no, that's great. Uh, you know, hopefully that's that's a good good overview, and we'll dive into a lot of a lot of the things. You know, as 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 career progression is concerned with Brent and and more more broadly, right? So maybe we start off with career planning, right? What led you down, you know, into the career of investment making? A lot of students, you know, the profile of the audience roughly is 50% freshmen, sophomores, about 30, 40% junior seniors, and then remainders are, you know, are post grads and, and et cetera. So what led you down this path and kind of what have been some of the highlights of this experience? So uh, you may not believe this, and this sounds like a little a little ridiculous, so I'll acknowledge that, but I said I wanted to be an investment banker starting around the time that I was about four years old. I don't think I <laughs> Like actually, all of us. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't think I actually at that time knew what investment banking was, but I knew I wanted to be it. Um, but in all seriousness, I, I you know, learned a lot more about it when I was in college. I was involved in the work in Columbia here in New York, was involved in a number of finance and kind of social and different uh, activities on campus, and met a bunch of people from a bunch of different careers. I think I considered seriously management kind of strategy consulting. Investment banking, sales and trading, those are really kind of the three areas that I narrowed in on. Um, I met a bunch of people who were interested in those, you know, those fields who are older than I was at school and kind of told me about them and their experiences. I met a bunch of people who were young professionals at those at those various uh, companies and doing those various jobs. And I think investment banking specifically ultimately drew me in because I think it's gives you an unparalleled sort of experience in terms of learning, in terms of uh, you know, exposure to both really consequential things that are going on, transactions and things of that nature, as well as really impressive and successful people. And so it's a really great opportunity to learn from people. Right. Um, I would say, in full disclosure, the thing that scared me about it, and part of the reason I considered some of the other professions I met, or mentioned was, uh, the reputation for really, really long hours. And frankly, that was you know, kind of something that was uh, a question for me because it is, it is ultimately, or can be ultimately really, really long hours. Right. Um, but I think the more and more I learned about, the more people I met um, who were doing it and enjoying it, uh, you know, the more I, I was ultimately interested in the profession and chose to pursue it. Cool. Yeah, I think so. That's interesting. I think a lot of a lot of the students I, I mean, I've spoken to a lot of schools this fall, and I think one of the big questions that comes up is, you know, what are some advice you can share about finding that right career as a student, right? Like, is it you talk to a lot of people, you do a lot of this research, but there's still kind of plethora of careers. You mentioned a couple of those: management, consulting, trading, uh, investment banking, etc. Is it getting experiences, and you know, how do you get an internship when you're in college? So, how do you advise students on kind of finding that career? That they're interested in? Good question. I think it's ultimately pretty tough. I think the answer is um, there are probably, depending on where you all are, you know, a handful of opportunities you will come into contact with, with companies you come on campus, 
this with peers of yours who are older who are going to do things. And I think that that often ends up being a, both a good way to learn about them, but also how you end up hearing about different various professions. I think ultimately, and I don't know the actual number, but I remember reading some research about people changing careers like five, six, seven times throughout their lives. And I think the reality is, and you heard Koshik talk about all the various different things he's done, consulting, banking, private equity. I think, um, you know, it's, it's what you're choosing now is not your necessarily your forever, you know, career. And I kind of approach it or would suggest approaching it as where you think right now coming out of school helps you to learn the most, helps you to kind of establish yourself, learn about what other professions are out there, work with other smart, driven people, um, and it opens other opportunities for you. And I think ultimately you may find in doing a career that it's your forever career and you love it and you want to do it forever. Um, or you may find, hey, like I liked these five things about it and I didn't like these five things and try to find something that has those five things that you like most. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. Um, so I have a question in from uh, a sophomore uh, at Stanford who asked, um, you know, as you think about, I guess they they want to inquire more about the role of investment and investment banker in general. So can you talk about um, kind of how your roles evolved? You know, for the people on the on the on the call who are going into investment banking or, or interested in investment banking, kind of what did you do as an analyst? How did that evolve into what you do? So maybe start with an analyst or even a summer analyst to an analyst and talk about that. Yeah. So I think I think there's generally an impression that it's kind of that function change and each title is a different role. I think it's true to an extent, but I, I would view it more as kind of a wrong slope. And the ideal you know, case and the, the goal, is when you start as a summer analyst, you're just, day one, you're just learning. And for a lot of people, and you turn this person into a question from Stanford, uh, I don't think there's a ton of business courses and things like that at Stanford, there certainly wasn't in Columbia. So I came in not having accounting or corporate finance experience or not much of it. Um, and ultimately, when you start, they don't expect you to have much and they teach you a lot and you're just expected to kind of take it all in and it's a little bit drinking from a fire hose. And I think the goal is by the end of your summer internship, you're performing like the first year of a full time analyst. And by the end of your analyst times, you're performing a lot of your And by the end of your associate and so on. And so I think it is kind of more progression. I think the general way to think about the different roles and responsibilities is the more senior you are, the more you're, um, you know, client facing, trying to win business, trying to you know, drive the overall sort of project or strategy or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and the more junior you are, the closer you are to the numbers and doing the analysis and doing the research and putting together some of the data and analysis that supports a thesis or, or you know, um, that, that is ultimately used by senior people. And I think you get exposure to both at all levels. You'll see clients as a junior person, hopefully, or you know, I, I, I was lucky to. Um, I think at the senior level, they also do some, you know, research and things of that nature, but it's more of a, a kind of a progression. Yeah. Yeah. So this question came in from uh, another sophomore at uh, working with Penn. Um, talk about the best parts about the job. So, what did you do as an analyst that you were you know, super proud of? Um, and you know, talk a little bit about training for the fire hose, but what, what in your you know, mindset was the best part of the things that you're working on? <clears throat> So I'd say, I'd say two things. One is the people. I mean, I think that was true. It was a big part of what attracted me to Goldman. I enjoyed, I'm not just saying this, but this year I actually go to work in Pache, uh, closely when I, when I first started out. So I think the people is a big thing. Um, and ultimately that drives the second thing, which is all that I learned. And I think looking back at like, you know, when I first started as a summer analyst and trying to figure out how to like, set up a dial in or send out an invite or whatever on Outlook or how to use Excel and things like that. And I remember as a first year looking at, uh, first year analysts looking at the more experienced analysts and how they never touch their mouse and like seemed like, you know, keyboard wizards. Um, you know, looking back at that, it's just amazing how far you've come over time and how much you learn, both the tactical things of, you know, how to do all the keyboard shortcuts and be really fast when you're making Excel or PowerPoint or whatever to the, the much more big picture things that you take with you kind of throughout your life and throughout your careers, um, you know, about how businesses work, about what types of things senior leaders of companies think about on a day-to-day -day basis and how they think about those things. Um, and some of the experiences in particular that we were really learning, 
uh, Kashik and I worked together on an IPO, and you know, we got a lot of room to run that process um, on kind of a day to day basis. We got a lot of exposure to the CEO, CFO, very senior leaders uh, at the company that we're advising. And you know, that's the type of thing that I don't think there are many other professions where, as a 22 year old out of college, you know, you're not even with a business degree, like no right. real experience that you get in any other. Yeah, and I, I actually think that is the coolest part of the job. We can talk about a lot of people coming into investment banking and, and, and why, or not just, you know, just type of finance careers or, or consulting where you are in that position to advise clients. And you have really the opportunity to solve very complex, challenging problems at some of the top firms and work with some of the smartest people. And I think it's an unparalleled level of responsibility. Like whether you decide to stay in that career or move on to other things in terms of a starting off point, it's a tremendous, you know, tremendous um, place to start. Um, so maybe we can get a little bit more tactical here and, and um, talk a little bit more about recruiting, about recruiting right? So Brant um, has been heavily involved in recruiting throughout his career, I think it's something, and he'll talk about this as well. It's important, I think, mean, similar to kind of what Elevate and all the other things do, it's important to kind of build that next level of talent, especially at these companies where I think there's a lot of focus on, on recruiting. Um, kind of maybe, and this is, this is a question from someone at, at Yale, a, a sophomore at Yale. Um, Given your experience in, in a recruiting, what is your decision process in evaluating candidates, right? So um, what are the key qualities you look for? Uh, what types of, uh, we'll, 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 maybe we'll start with that in, sure. in, in so I think, minutes. I think it's probably, and it's a question I get a lot, it's a good question. I think it's, um, unfortunately, there's not a magic kind of answer. Um, I think it's all of the things you would expect. People kind of need to have pretty good, you know, strong academic profile, ideally from, you know, a, a rigorous school or a rigorous program within a school, um, you know, with good grades and things of that nature. I think it's also kind of professional experience of some form. And it's, as you mentioned earlier, it's, it can be hard to find an internship or get an internship. It sounds a little bit like catch 22 of, oh, you need experience to get the internship, but you need the internship to get experience how to do that. Um, <clears throat> But ultimately, I think people who are successful do have some level of experience. And, and lastly, it's just kind of involvement or, you know, interest or doing other things. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I think the biggest way people differentiate themselves are by being known before the resume deadline, before they submit their application. Yeah. Ultimately, you know, at, at Goldman, we would get kind of 300 or so applications from Columbia alone. And we would give 20 or so first round interviews, and five or six of them would ultimately get internship offers. And so those numbers sound daunting, but ultimately, you know, you see 300 resumes, and 275 of them have good grades, have experience, and have, you know, some sort of other activities or leadership or whatever. Um, and so the way that people really differentiate is by having taken the time to network and taking the time to meet people. And then having somebody who's in that room looking at the resume saying, oh, I met this person, I like them, I think they'd be a good fit for the firm, because that's ultimately what you're trying to assess when you go to do the interview. And so if you get a preview of that and think they're going to show well in the interview, then, then you're more likely to kind of pass it through. Yeah, I mean, that's, I think from the numbers you pointed out, but also I think that's, that's a really important point. We'll spend a good amount of time on networking, because I think that is top of mind for a lot of students on how to do that successfully. You're right, it is very daunting. You know, I, I go to these schools and I think that's the number one discussion topic or one of the top three that, that get talked about. How do you network and how do you do that successfully? So we'll, we'll get to that. I think all the points you mentioned, and I think what's also helpful is to put yourself in the shoes of kind of, what are the, what are the things that the employees are looking for? The investment bank, you know, in order, what makes a good analyst, right? I mean, it's the analytical ability, some of the stuff Frank talked about. It's the ability to kind of be a leader and, and be a self-starter. So some of the experiences that you may have, had in college, and then you know, number three is is this a good fit? Like, is this a good fit candidate for 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 a firm? You get a lot of that by meeting people through the process and, and at interviews. Um, so it, it's a question I, I got from a uh, this is a, a, a freshman or a freshman from Northwestern uh, University on it is this kind of cash twenty two thing, right? So how do you? What are the types of things that you know are, are some of our you know freshmen or or sophomore listeners can do? Um, to get that first internship, you know, what types of jobs should they be targeting and, and, and you know, what, 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 what can they do to be successful? So I kind of say don't overthink it, and I know that sounds a little cavalier or flippant, but it's, it's not intended to be. I think 
that um, you know ultimately my internship. So I had interns at an insurance company and a few different roles there over time. Starting in IT, which had nothing to do with anything I did later. Um, corporate finance, investing role there, and then uh, interned at uh, a bank and did some like kind of sales and more like traditional banking activities. Um, and neither of those on the face were either firms that I necessarily you know had in mind in terms of going to for investment banking and didn't have investment banks. Um, and neither of those roles were investment banking roles. So. What I found is in all of those, I found things that actually were applicable and that I learned that I could take with me and that I could talk about in the interviews. And so as an example, I mentioned the internship at a bank, it was a sales-like role. I talked about that in my interview when I interviewed at Goldman, and it was one of the things that some interviewers found most interesting. They were like, oh, wow, you did sales. Tell me about that. How did you think about it? And kind of probing on those things. Um, some of the other things are like you learn, you start to learn how to use Excel and Word and PowerPoint and things like that. It sounds silly, but it actually is helpful in demonstrating kind of capability to do. And so I would just say, do something. It's not like even kind of when you're depending on how old you are and where you are in your um, in your progression at school and all that. Um, People are ultimately looking to see that you didn't just spend the summer kind of on a beach somewhere. Hopefully, it gets to be a good amount of the summer, but um, that you did something that was advancing the skill set and that you were clearly trying to go towards something over time. Um, and that's the last thing I would say is try to, and it's not always going to be intentional. You may be just taking, and this is certainly what I did, which was taking the opportunity that I could find that sounded interesting that I could get. Um, but I think later on, try to think about before you go have these networking conversations before you get interviews, how you connect the dots and why you say through your time, you know, I learned this here and this is what I really liked about it, but I wanted, you know, X, Y, Z that I wasn't getting towards the issue there and that, you know, I found in this next step or whatever. It doesn't actually have to truly have been a linear progression, but you kind of making it seem like yeah, so a lot of, I think that the, that was a really good answer. I had. Kind of my thoughts on this question, I get asked this question a lot. You know, where do you start? It is daunting. Look, it is too daunting to think of it as a freshman or sophomore to be like, hey, I'm going to get an, you know, an investment banking internship my summer of my freshman sophomore year. I think the linear progression point is really important. And then the point to be like, try to get the best shot that you possibly can, but obviously don't go crazy, right? So whatever it is, and if it's, if it's not business related, that's the best job you can get, get it and do a good job at it. If it's a business-related job, get a business-related job. The brand's point is insurance company, like a you know services company, a software company, whatever it is. So you know, go out there as a freshman and and try to get those internships. And, and let's say you get an internship at that company, try to do a job that has an analytical role in it, you know, some sort of a people management, you know, people connecting, people role, etc. So just try to like make your experiences be, you know better and better and better as much as possible. And the last point there is just how you position it when you come to these, come to these discussions. Is you know. Take the things in them, create stories out of these things to say, hey, look, this was the issue that the company was having, and I helped on the sales strategy, and then that resulted in you know X, Y, and Z improvement in sales, you know, whatever the number is. I think myself as an interviewer, I think Grant would say the same thing. We look for those things that are initiative-driven, purpose-driven, and results-oriented that, that are, you know, people are passionate about their thing, uh, you know, their experience. Like, would you agree with that? Yeah. yeah. So the one cautionary thing I would say is, is just be be mindful if ultimately you do want to go into investment or consulting or whatever about what you do along the way in terms of pattern. What I mean by that is something that I've seen a lot, and it's not just qualifying, but it's something you then have to explain to just think about it. <clears throat> is somebody who's pre-med, biology major, and did poor research or like medicine type internship, and then shows up for an investment banking interview or you know, wants to get an investment banking job. And they have it, you know, the, the question you get is like, oh, don't you want to go to medicine or research like you did all these other things? So think about if you are trying to get somewhere, how you kind of take each step as a step towards that. It doesn't, again, it doesn't have to be completely linear. You don't actually have to get the investment internship before you go for your, you know, kind of real, you know, post-junior year one. But, um, but things along the way, try not to make it look like you were directly heading somewhere else if you could.
Yeah, and that's a good point. I, I get some of these questions from you know pre-med, I get it from engineering and things like that. In addition to that, I think look, your your past is what it is, right? I think you, you have to, yes, it's 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 good to have the foresight and, and absolutely go along this path that you can explain. But if you at some time want to make this transition, I think you just use the experience in the past, linear, you know, correlate them to the things that you're looking at, and then you move on and try to get those experiences, try to get school your internships, you know, be creative in, in what, what you do, and I think people people really respect that. Um, I really yeah. recommend the whole school year and yeah. different things to the to the extent that you have the time or the ability to do so, I think it goes along the same. I always intern during the school year. I actually did it because I wanted money to be able to spend. <laughs> but uh, but when I had interviews and talked to people, they often were really impressed because it's like, oh wow, you did school, which was your main thing you're supposed to be doing, and then you also did this other thing, which was getting you experience and showing interest in hard work and whatever. And I think that can go along there. Yeah. It's a good point. So then let's talk a little bit about the, uh, we'll, we'll stay with the kind of, kind of the, the recruiting team. Um, when you get, to, you get to talk about the 300 resumes, getting it down to, you know, X, 50, first cut, or whatever, um, what, what do you look for in them, right? So you've done, you've recruited for Goldman and all these other places where, you know, five, six years now. So like, what do you look for them, uh, in them, and what do you look to see? So ideally, if the recruiting team is doing their job, and the candidates are doing their job, then you don't even have to look at resumes by the time the resumes come. And what I mean by that is you're going to get, again, 300, and I think on average we have like five or so people from Columbia Law who we got internships, and 20 who got interviews. Like that's a, it's really hard to just look at a resume and say, here are the people that you know, we want to take for interviews. And if you did that, you would find 200, 250, whatever, right. that, that would check the box. And even if you narrowed it down really significantly, it's kind of the same advice people will give you when you're applying to some of the connecting schools that you want to go to. You know, if you could you could fill an entire Goldman Sachs analyst class with people with four O's and whatever, you know, other other perfect stats that you think sound good. So I think there's a minimum level of like for for many firms, you need to have a pretty strong academic background. Um, and that depending on who um, you know, where you're applying and whatever, how they weight these things, like GPA is important and some people care more about it than others. Um, but in any case, everyone cares about it, at least to some extent. And so if you, you, know, you kind of need to have a pretty strong GPA. But then beyond that, I think it's showing an interesting profile that again has kind of some level of professional experience and some level of leadership experience. And so it's not being involved in 50 different things where you say you are a member or any of those things. It's not you're trying to add the resume of like, oh, I went to this conference or something, but it's saying, you know, I, I was a member of this group and then I became the treasurer and then I became vice president and next year I hope to be president or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that sort of thing. I think that's what they're looking for because ultimately that's what, you know, we look for because ultimately that's what we want when you come to work there is that you learn and you develop skills and you meet people and then you make the next step. Um, so certainly with the resume, but yeah, I wouldn't overplay the resume in the sense that to your point earlier, by the time you're applying, what you have is what you have, and there's only so much you can do. And two, um, you know, ultimately the recruiting team strive at most places if it's a big enough team to meet a lot of people over the course of the recruiting process. And so I used to do 50 coffee chats or something, or 50 phone calls or whatever in a, in a season. And we meet some people, and, and certainly with the whole team, the analysts and people who are you know, alumni there, having those chats, by the time everyone gets in the room, we can stop that for the resume book. Each person has like a few people they've met through the process that they think are really great, and they've already seen the resume. And therefore, yeah, easier. yeah, I think that's a good point. And the, the resume is really a proxy for how you present your story, right? So, the, the way you're presenting your story is is how you know when you reach out to alumni, when you reach out, we'll, we'll get to networking and, and information in a second, but that's how you present your story and how you're going to make that first level of impact. So, by the time you're formally submitting the resume, like Grant said, most of the time, you know, folks have met a lot of the students already out there. There's certain exceptions to maybe summer internship or early programs and things like that, which, which we won't, you know, we'll get to. Later, but I think that the whole point is think about how you're presenting your story and collecting 
stories and collecting those out of experiences. And that's what you actually share with people in the informational and, and all that stuff. So I think, I think in that sense, your resume should capture that even long before you're, you're, you're you know, pumping out to the, like, the career service website for, for a job. Um, so let's, and, and, and for, the, for the other kind of uh, third half of the students who are juniors and seniors, like what are some advice as they go in, and we'll get to kind of succeeding on the job a little bit later, but as they think about, you know, their summer internships or, you know, full time, and, and what should they try to get them out of their summer internships and, and then think about their career full time, you know, as for their first hour to that. Yeah, so I think the early internships, like, after freshmen, sophomore, those types of things, when you're getting these experiences, the biggest thing you're trying to get out, I would say, is trying to figure out what you like and don't like, and then later being able to have that, and how those things connect to us to the internship after your junior year, which they try to get in, in the banking or something like that. I think in banking, if you do the junior year internship, that's critical to get in the full time offer, um, and the biggest Thing about it is to get that full time offer ultimately. And so I would treat it almost like a kind of interview where you should take it really seriously. You should do everything you can and work really hard, you know, show up early, try to be as helpful as you can, stay as long as your team that you're working with is there, those types of things, which are not necessarily things that over time in your career will be encouraged. But when you're there for nine weeks, like, you know, it's, it's one of the only ways you can demonstrate that you're serious about it and that you're, you know, going to, willing to do everything, as long as you can, et cetera. So I would just focus on trying to take it seriously. I think the people who, and ultimately people who get internships, the goal is for all of those people to get full time offers. And most places hire in a way that they have as many full time spots as they get internships. So every single person could get an offer. Um, the people who stumble along the way tend to be people who are, you know, and look at a second or third year analyst who's leaving in a few weeks to go to private equity or whatever, and are like, oh, that person, you know, showed up late and went to the gym and took a long lunch, and so that's okay for me to do as well. And I, I think you just have to have the self awareness and situational awareness to know that this is a nine week interview and it's not about what other people are doing, it's about what you do and how serious you show that you are about it and, and how seriously you take it. Yep, yep, that's really good advice. And we'll get to kind of best practices on the job um, a little bit later. Uh, I, I totally agree with that. I think the, the goal of the summer is to treat it as a nine, nine, week, nine week interview, but also, you know, develop that sense of, of, for yourself, what that job is, you know, what that job entails. Like talking to people around you to get a good sense of what you're actually getting yourself into. Because it's sometimes, you know, it's obviously a two-way street. You want to choose these as career paths, right? The other thing is, I would challenge everyone going to these internships to take on one or two or three things that are responsibilities that they can say, hey, I want to own, you know, maybe by week three or week four, this particular part of the weekly update or this particular thing, this process item, et cetera, which I think helps make the difference as we're looking at folks to give offers to or whatever the case is, uh, to be like, hey, this person actually stepped up, we think they'll be a good, you know, they're, they're taking responsibility and as a result will be good in this job long term, right? Yeah. Yeah. There was one specific intern that stands out in my mind that I both worked with. And I remember we would work on some things, and there were times where something was just so busy and such a short timeline, and you really did need to be that accelerator or whatever to clean something to get it done and get it to the client. And so it wasn't a great opportunity for the intern in that specific situation. There's one intern I worked with where I was the analyst, I was working on something, we got a client, and afterwards he came up to me and he's like, hey Brad, later on when the time is a little quieter, can you show me and walk me through what you did and how you did it and teach me about it? Because he was genuinely interested in marketing. And it impressed me, and it sounds silly, but at the end of the day, a lot of people are like, great. They're like, that task is done, I'm done here, you know? And I think if you have a genuine interest in the work, and you're really serious about it and take it seriously. To yeah. your point, whether that's trying to own something that you actually do, or just trying to learn something that was done on your own I think it's a yeah. powerful thing. That's, I remember this intern also, and they were also from a non-target school, right? So it's one of those things where it's just, they didn't go to necessarily through the training of some of the, you know, some other folks maybe even gone before this. So I, I agree, that was really impressive. I think it showed like a level of, of ownership in your work. So, I, I, I think, you know, we'll, we'll get back to that if we have time towards the end. So let's spend a little bit of a minute on 
list of every Saturday and the human hat is outside. But um, let's uh, let's spend a little bit of uh, time on networking, right? So, like, I think a lot of students that I talk to are are very um, intimidated by networking, and, and they kind of don't know where to start off at, how to even make that first connection. So. I got, I got a student here from Duke, um, you know, sophomore at Duke, who asked, you know, what are the most effective ways to succeed at networking? How do you even get started? And, and what do you do to kind of keep through that process? Sure. So I think there are two ways. One is the generic way that you need to do, which is go to every information session. Go to them as well, like earlier. So if you have the opportunity, it depends on where you are in school. But if you go as a freshman, sophomore, like, go early if you know it's something you want to do eventually. And treat those as, I would like to call it kind of like a speed dating type thing, where you try to meet as many people in a respectful, interesting, you know, like way, uh, and get their business card. And so you, a lot of times, these events will have like hundreds of students, and you'll have 15 people that work for a company. If you can meet five, six, ten of those people while you're there in the networking session, that can be really powerful and take the business card. And they're not, chances are, going to remember many, if any, of the 300 people they meet that night, especially when it's 10 people standing around them in the circle. Um, and so I would just, you know, try to go up, ask a question or two, listen to what, what other people have to say for a minute or two, and then say, thank you very much, we have this car, take your hand walk away. And I would use the opportunity less to kind of impress them, because there's more risk to the downside there. And do the opportunity instead to just get the contact and then later on follow up with them and try to have a phone call and coffee chat. And some will be willing to come along directly. Yep. The, the most effective way, though, and this is less about getting leads, and so that's part of you kind of have to figure out, depending on your interest in thinking you can develop an effort. But I think the most effective way is to try and find somebody or some people who genuinely are invested in your success and genuinely care about you. And so uh, that can be you know, someone you knew who's a couple years above you and some activity you did and went to that company. It can be someone you meet in an affinity group or a diversity event or a networking session. It could, have, it could end up being one of the people you met at one of these events. Um, but ultimately try to find people that because they were alumni, because they're family friends, because they're whatever, they met you in some specific context, that they feel invested in you because I met a few of those that were alumni of my fraternity that I was in or different things. And those people were willing, therefore, to make introductions for me. So if you pass me around to that firm, put me in touch with the people and help guide me to who were the people who were actually in the room reviewing the resume that we can need to talk to and those types of things. Right. I think there is often a feeling that networking just means talk to as many people as possible. And you should do that because that increases the chances that you talk to the right people. But um, the best you can do to try to find somebody who cares about you, who then ends up in that resume room, or who knows somebody that ends up in that, re that reviewing room, that will sit there and say, I really like this person because they're very good. That's and yeah. ultimately what gets you there. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. So I think what uh, summarize that and also add I think just a couple of thoughts on my end. Like just going to the networking session. Um, you know, for that company, and, and a lot of the folks who are, who are on the, you know, listening to this may not have companies come to their schools, right? So that's funny too. My point is just going to that networking session and being one of the 200 people who goes to this for a networking session is not going to be enough, right? And, and, and frankly, it's, it's probably even the least important part of the process. Kind of what you do with A, the people that you meet during that session and, and establish that relationship. But I would say over 50% of this is your own effort in kind of cold emailing people, you know, whether they're going through your alumni network, like Brent mentioned, some of the connectivity that you might have, those fraternities, athletic groups, student groups, whatever the case might be that, you know, connecting out, reaching out to them, school via school, via you just cold email LinkedIn people, etc. I think that those have a much higher likelihood in some, you know, cold emails on their own don't have a lot, of, you know, high likelihood, but as, as a whole, are actually could be impactful if you reach out to enough people and, and make enough uh, connections. The really, really important thing of what Brad mentioned was having three or four or five of those people across the street or across the different firms you're looking at be able to vouch for you in that meeting. That's the goal here, right? So network in order to get to that next step. Like networking isn't the end goal or you know, people to get this. So maybe let's start, start, you know, spend a minute. This is a question from a junior at, at, at Brown University. Um, how should students approach informational 
So if you network with someone and then they say, hey, all right, let's spend, you know, let's get on the phone for, you know, 15 minutes to, to chat about your career or whatever the case might be. So how, 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 what, are, what are some tips and what, what are things you well and what are things that you know, people don't do? So I would say informational interview and have the sense that either it's really about you gathering a bunch of information or that it's some sort of an interview. And I wouldn't try to treat it as either of those, and I'll explain what I mean by that. One is you should have a base knowledge of information when before you have that information with you about the firm, about the job, about those types of things. And I think the networking events actually can be good opportunities to go and hear them give their speech, tell you about a day in the life, tell you about the firm, give you some you know things about what they like about the company or whatever, so that you show up to the informational and you know a little bit. Yep. Um, so one thing I would say is don't show up to the informational and be like. What is Goldman Sachs? What do you do? What is investment banking? Like those types of things will stick with that person as, oh, this person doesn't know what's going on. So the types of things you should do, therefore, are asking about things you couldn't find online or things you couldn't find by having the staff in the firm wide presentation or whatever um, that are more specific either to that individual. So spend a lot of time asking them about their background, how they got to where they are. What they like about it, what they don't like about it, a lot of types of things that Boston and I can tell you about here today, um, and about the culture of the firm, about the group, about the things they like most in their day to day, and least, and whatever. Mm -hmm. I think those are the types of things that will both give you the most information about the career, really, um, besides just the generic, this is what we do in investment banking, um, and also give you a real opportunity to learn, and for them to learn, based on your responses and yeah. reactions yeah, yeah, yeah. to what they say. Whether you're a good fit there, whether you like that company, and whether it makes you know, real sense. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. A couple of things I'd say is preparation, really, really important, right? Allude to this kind of set up the interview. You know, you have 10 minutes, right? Go through it and say, hey, look, 30 seconds on my background. I've, I've linked in this person. This is what I know that they do. Talk, you know, second level, third level type questions on you know, the group that they're in, the stuff that they've worked on, and then get into, you know, the firm, things that you really want to know. The goal of these things should be to watch them be walking, walk being like, all right, this is a mature person who's prepared for the job, has it, you know, has a good background, you know, probably good or better than what other people do, but it's really, really, really in the maturity and the preparation and the execution of the call and those sessions that differentiate. Because they want to, you know, you want to get off the phone and then call the rep from the green team and say, hey, this person is an interesting, you know, good candidate. And be flexible with them, and it may be that you get five or seven minutes, plan for 30 or more. And the reason I say that is, like, a lot of these, Often people will set aside 30 minutes or something like that for these conversations. What you don't want to do is have to plan three questions, get on the phone, ask three questions, and then they're expecting a 30 minute conversation and they're like, Do you have anything else to ask? And they're like, No, thank you. It's five minutes. Right. So plan for more. Don't be offended or take personally if they're like, I got to go to something now for five minutes. Yeah. Um, so front load some of these things, but prepare for, for longer discussions and be ready. Right. right. Yeah. And I used to write out double-sided just lists of questions and you won't necessarily ask everyone you want to do it in an organic way it doesn't want to be you know now question number three on my list is this like you want to fold them in in an organic way um but just be prepared to talk to the point because you don't want to you want to seem like you're you're not wasting their time you're there yeah. to actually learn something you're there to meet someone and then you have to talk yeah and the uh yeah no, that's where you're going um yeah, so so we can go to so so one question that comes up a lot. This question came from um, actually a, a sophomore at Harvard. You know what, what happens if you uh, you know you don't get a response to your email, right? You, you send a hundred of these out, right? Yeah. Um, so what happens if you don't get a response? Like how do you follow up? How do you not follow up? When do you follow up? I follow up once and not more than once. Yeah. Um, I think the reality is, and I'm guilty of this, but it, people want to respond. Off, you know, to a lot of these, um, often people won't have the time or you know ability um, or desire to respond to all of them. And it's not a personal thing, you know, by any means. But um, like I said, I told you some of the numbers for Columbia. If you go to one of these info sessions, even if you have every intention of talking to a single person who wants to talk to you after, you may have 50 requests for coffees or calls or whatever, and you have a day job doing 50 of these is and Koshik used to make fun of me because I would do a lot of things, right. like two, three a week, um, and during recruiting seasons more than that. And you know, a lot of people just don't have the time to do 
that, and I certainly really don't anymore in the way that I used to. And so don't be discouraged by it. You don't want to annoy people or come across in the wrong way. If someone doesn't respond once, there's a chance it just slipped and they right. meant to respond and they forgot about it or whatever, or you sent it, they were so busy, and then by the time they saw it again, it was two weeks later and was at that point like kind of awkward to respond or old news or whatever so far later. Yep. So it doesn't hurt. I would say wait a week or two weeks, mm -hmm. send another email, you know, just following up, um, kind of as a reply all to your original email. If they don't respond to that, chances are for a reason yeah. and move on. Yeah. Totally agree. I think another thing that uh, I think a week to two weeks is a good amount of time. And it's, it's always helpful, you know, if you wrote a long email right at the beginning, some people do. Try to keep them short, but I, I get it. We all try to, you know, over index on, hey, I've done all these cool things and I get all that. You can make your follow up kind of two lines or two or three sentences that, hey, just following up on this, um, you know, you know, if you would love to say, catch up and you know, if you realize you're busy, we'd love to catch up in your time, blah, blah. And, and people get it. And, and sometimes I actually, I'll say this, like, and, when I get the second email as like a reminder, I'm more likely to follow up. So, so just you know, don't go crazy. But I think realize that your hit rate might be higher actually in the second follow-up. Yeah. Don't send six follow-ups. Right, 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 right. That'll right. be like right. in the resume thing. This guy right. would not leave me alone if you follow up every day. Right. But that's a big negative, like, right? Don't. Yeah. And then the other thing is, if, you know, if you met someone and you kind of had a talk with someone, it's it's nice to let's say you're a sophomore and you met someone in an in, 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 in event. Like four or five months later, just shoot them an update, and, but give them an update of something that you might be working on. Be like, hey, I worked on this case study. I worked on this, you know, X, Y, and Z. And I think people then be like, okay, cool. Now this name, you know, John Smith case study. Oh, I've talked to this person here. Good candidate. All right, so this is a good progression, right? Yeah, I right. try to do that throughout. Yeah, throughout it's relationship career, right? Ultimately, yeah. Ultimately, I still get some of those. I'm not as good at that as I should be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. That's right. But I do still get some of those emails from people who. Went on and got whatever job they got, whether or not it was the best or whatever, and still a year or two later will send me an email and be like, hey, I'm doing this idea for you. And it, you then actually develop a real relationship. Yeah. And it's not a transactional yeah. thing about a recruiter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think relationships are important. The other thing is, look, we don't know how the summer internship is going to go. We don't know how the full time jobs are going to go. So it's, you know, a lot of times I think people come back to people they've met through the recruiting process. To be like, hey, you know, I really enjoyed interacting with this firm. So, you know, maybe we, we re engage and, and, and see you know, how things are going, right? Yeah. Um, okay, cool. So let's keep going. And, uh, and you know, so, so let's talk a little about interviews. So, you've obviously done hundreds of interviews over your career. Um, so, what, uh, what, this is a question from uh, another student in Harvard, uh, a sophomore. Um, what advice, or, you know, how do you approach the interview? What are things successful candidates do? And what are things that not so successful candidates do? So I think there's, so most interviews have two components. One is kind of a fit component of just tell me about yourself, tell me about your experiences, tell me about the time you, is it something tailed to answer those types of questions. The other part is more technical of um, walk me through a DCF or a kind of classic example. Mm -hmm. like that. I think you need to be well prepared for both. I think the technical often I would say it's more or less a check to the box in the sense that it's really hard to be like, wow, that person like really do DCS. Like, <laughs> I mean, there's an answer they're looking for. There's the right answer to the question and that's it. And it's good if you know it in detail and it's good if you know what each component is one layer down so that they drill in, you know, but that's pretty much all you can do and you get the right answer or you don't. So try to get the right answer, try to study. The best way to learn those and learn what kind of questions they'll ask is probably something like the Wolf Guide or the Wall Street Oasis or any of those types of things. Um, the, I think often people will overlook the fit uh, aspect and I think that that you shouldn't. It's one of the most important um, aspects of the interview process. I think technicals, can be disqualifying and like the kind of check the box, you either have it or you don't. But fit is where the decision is ultimately made. And nobody goes in the room and, you know, after the interview and you're discussing who you interviewed for the license. Like, nobody goes in and it's like, again, they really did a great job with the DCF. They go in and say, wow, this person has XYZ experiences. They really knew about the culture of insert name a firm. They really did their own work and met with a bunch of people. They said kind of all the right things to make us believe that they will be a good fit here and know what they're getting into and all of that. And I think that's 
Yeah, and we had, I'm just gonna, I popped up a few questions that we got through the session and we'll go through those as well. Um, and, and I think that, I think on the, in the interview front, yeah, absolutely preparation. Um, just, so, you know, similar to kind of what I was saying in informational, like, uh, it's more, more so in the informational work, it just get out there and do these informational sites because I think the hardest part is actually getting in front of people, even if you have your story down cold, it's just talking about it in an informational or interview setting, it's, it's very, very nerve wracking and challenging, right? Yeah, one other thing that I'll say is there are a few questions you will definitely, definitely get. The three most common ones, and I'm going to use banking as a placeholder, but for any profession that are similar, is tell me about yourself. Right? Tell me why investment banking, and tell me why interview firm. And I think all of those are extremely important. Those are the three most important questions. You should be prepared for that poll and ready to go. Yep. And of those, why interview firm, I think is arguably the most important question because a lot of people come in and they're like, I I want to work at a global firm that does investment banking. And they're like, okay, so that applies to the firms. Yeah. So if you have a really good answer of I, you know, whatever the aspect of the culture is that really resonates true to that place, um, or um, you know, somebody you met and they were telling you this, or some event you went to and it was really impressive, whatever, those are the types of things where people are like, oh wow, you really get it. You know what makes us different, right. and you seem to think that you get good fit, and that makes me think that you get good fit. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah, I, I, I told you that. Uh, I think I think just having like logical answers that connect your understanding of the field that you're getting, whether it's banking or, or even consulting, or whatever it is, understanding of the field, understanding of what about yourself that makes you prepared to be successful in that field, and then you know, coherently talking about some of the experiences that get you ready to, 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 to get prepared for that. I think really important. A few questions we got along the way. I'll I'll I'll, I'll just I'll address students from Yale. Kind of wants to, wanted to talk about and, and ask Grant um, a question from Yale. Um, what is the role of technology and data science as it relates to kind of the evolution of finance as we go forward? You know, what do you see? What do you see in terms of the people you recruit and the types of backgrounds that they have, and then as well as the job itself and, and how you know how it's evolving you know, with, with the environment around it? Yeah, and I think it's something that has been increasingly an area of focus. Actually, in particular, coming from people who are new to the field and are doing uh, you know, computer science or whatever kind of thing, but I've grown up with a ton of technology and I'm like, oh, you know, I, I've worked with some people where they're, we do certain types of things, we do them frequently, and they're like, have you ever thought about automating this or doing X, Y, Z? And I'm like, I don't really know how to do that. If you want to do it, great. Uh, I think in general, the industry will move like every industry is more toward automation. I think a lot of firms are implementing standardized ways of doing things, using technology to ease kind of work, you know, um, growth tasks yeah. that you yeah. do regularly that are that are time consuming that you can do faster. Um, so I think you'll continue to see those. I think as a result, you'll ultimately see more commoditization of the kind of Professional services, investment banking, any of these consulting advising tech firms. I think there will be a lot of things that ultimately a client can do themselves if they have that technology, if that's the way it goes, or that every bank has their equivalent of that technology that spits out the answer, spits out the timeline, so that's what it looks like. Um, I think the things that will differentiate both banks and advisors and firms as for you and for clients and everything are the human elements that can never be replaced by kind of, you know, robots or computers mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, because a lot of banking ultimately is a sales job. A lot of it is a relationship job over time, and less so when you first start, but over time. Uh, it's about developing relationships with people, developing a sense of trust, and that's more than just an analytic, you know, sure. answer or anything like that. Yeah, and I think it's a good answer, and I, I was just have a couple points to that. I think tactical advice for students is, I think, in my, my personal view is where we are headed in just all industries, because look, we may start out in banking or consulting, but end up doing a lot of different things. So if technology is an area that is of interest where you think, you know, you're not just interested in, but you think is kind of where things are headed, I would say complement your, your existing degree with a data science or, you know, finance degree, and, and find ways or careers that kind of merge the two, right? 
That's number one. Number two, I think Grant's exactly right. A lot of the tasks themselves may become, you know, will become much more automated. But I think a couple of areas where I would see this going in finance. On the, on the advisory side, definitely strategy and the actual decision-making process where we'll spend a lot more time on you know, company strategy, how do you then process all this data that they have. Frankly, like we know this beyond yeah, working guys, but a lot of the Fortune 500 companies are sitting on a ton of data and, and from an advisory perspective, we're not using those to even now tap the surface of the best advice you can possibly give someone. So I think that's where that's headed in terms of advisory. I think in terms of investing and to make better investing decisions, right? So in private equity, right? We'll go through tons, and this is true in an hedge fund space, et cetera, too. We'll go through a ton and ton of data, but at the end of the day, it's about kind of, you know, the, the, the thing where I see private equity going in the next five to 10 years is just how you take all this information and make good, smart decision, investing decisions, where everyone around you has the same exact data, right? So I think they're developing that mindset around understanding companies, understanding businesses, understanding people, strategy, operations, et cetera, thereby making good strategic or investing decisions is where really, Judgment comes into play, and then the people that are able to develop that early on in their career will be the most successful. It's not just going to be the people who are able to like build the best Excel model. You know, I, I don't think that's ever been the case, but I think now with that, it, it kind of loses some value. I don't know. If you can that. Um, so let's keep going. Another question we got from a student at Rutgers actually is, all right. So now you know we're we're kind of at the job, right? So what advice do you have for students? We talked a little bit about succeeding on the job, but as you look about you think about your summer or you know as a full time. As you get, and we'll, we'll hit on exit options and, and careers in, in a second. But when you're there, whether it's in a consulting role or banking role, banking, like what do they do in their first few months? How does that evolve over the first year? And how do they think about their short term three to five year career? Sure. So I think within investment banking, when you kind of first start out, and it, um, go back to that progression that I was talking about in the beginning, which is if the closer you are to kind of new and coming out of school, what we first said for here. It's really about learning, it's about understanding all of the data, what all the terms mean, um, how to use everything, all those types of things. And then it's about using that learning to actually do things and put together their analysis and things like that. And I think over time, it will progress more and more towards spending more time with clients, thinking about the problems and thinking about the types of analyses that would be interesting to show and to um, do to kind of come to an answer. Um, but ultimately, I think when you start, it's a lot about doing kind of those analytics and those types of things. Yep. Um, I would always approach it, I think, and Patrick and I used to talk about this, but I think, you know, the, when you first start out, it's not, like, if your answer is, I want to do investment banking and be investment banking all for the money, don't do it. Like, that's not, it's not either going to make you happy, nor, more importantly, is it really worth it? And there are a lot of professions where you can do well. The, the answer needs to involve some level of, I'm interested in this type of stuff, business, finance, strategy, things like that, and I want to learn about it. And I think if you think about the two years out of school as, yeah, it's a job you're going to take, but you're, it's kind of an extension of school, and now you're learning some more practical hands-on type things, and you're learning about how business works, I think you'll find it much more interesting and engaging. And yeah, and what are the things that people, uh, this question got asked from someone at UPenn, uh, Gordon, um, a, a junior, um, what are the things that people kind of don't, who struggle with the job, like what are the things that people don't do well, that, that, they, sh that they could be better, as, as opposed to analysts? Yeah, I think there's a two-part answer. One is, over time, it's different than when you first start. Yeah. When you first start, it goes a lot back to what I'm saying as advice for your internship, which is the people who don't tend to do well when they first start or the people who don't kind of put in the effort. Mm -hmm. Like if you are actually genuinely interested, whether it's in a specific subject or you know just learning, period, and you're willing to put in the effort, I think you'll generally get something out of it. And I think people will see that and appreciate that. I think going with that is kind of a positive attitude and being happy. And it's it can be really long hours, particularly when you first start because you don't things just take longer and you don't know where to find all the information and you haven't done it before and so you're not as quick and it takes longer. And I think having a positive attitude and trying to always say positive is a really big part when you first start. Yeah. I think over time it becomes increasingly can we see this person as a partner or as a managing director or whatever um, over time and does this person have everything that it takes which involves the ability to kind of have client relationships get trust from people being kind of trustworthy individual, the ability to think 
strategically and analytically about things um, and the willingness to kind of do yeah. what it takes to get there. Got it. And we kind of time. We'll, take, we'll, we'll do two more questions that came in from students. Um, and then, you know, uh, and then we'll kind of see if the one was on exit ops and the other one was on um, kind of the, the, the managing your own personal interests in the whole work life thing. So maybe we'll touch on exit ops quickly, right? So obviously you've been in the industry long enough. What are some typical, you know, this came in from the uh, University of Chicago. Um, what are, you know, what are some of the paths that are kind of well worn? How do you approach those paths and maybe talk about kind of your own decision process, people you've seen? That you know, etc. Yeah, I think um, the most common exit opportunity is for Carl to go to private equity, to go to a hedge fund, a little less common private equity, or to go to kind of a corporate development role, or to stay within that game and do something either directly within that game or within the firm that you're at, if it's a larger firm. Like a larger firm um, I, I would say the biggest one is probably private equity. A lot of people who uh, that's kind of the the typical progression to the banking goes to private equity. I chose personally to stay in banking. Um, and I would encourage everyone, it's easy to just follow the path that everyone does, and a lot of us are accustomed to doing that along the way and getting into banking. Right. But I would encourage everyone to just try to take a step back. It's actually really hard because private equity recruiting happens like three days after you right. start your full time right. and sort of getting to that. It's yeah, it's literally yeah. three days after. Yeah. Um, so it can be challenging before you actually know banking. Side. But I would try to take a step back, try to think about yourself, what you actually genuinely like to do, what you find most interesting, and where aligns with that best. And so for some people, private equity is the right set of skills, the right set of things that they're going to do on a day to day basis over the next couple of years and over the next 10, 15 years. And that's the right answer. For some people, banking is the right answer. For some people, something else is the right answer. Um, and I would just try to not just follow the path, but think about, um, think about what you like, what you're good at, and how it aligns yeah. to, to the path. Totally agree with that. I think, look, these are all competitive careers, right? And and we all need to be aware and for the and prepare and ready for, uh, you know, be prepared for the, the competitiveness of even getting into these careers. But I think that one of the, the things that, and Brent alluded to, I hit on this exactly, is that there needs to be, and, and people, can, we all can be a better, um, aware, self-aware of the things that actually make ourselves most challenged, most impactful, most happy, you know, whatever those things are, and, 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 and put that, and also within your own strengths and weaknesses, like figure out what your own strengths and weaknesses are, and combine that with the knowledge of the job, and I think there you'll end up in a much better place of pursuing these careers and achieving success in them, right? Which would be great. So the last question we got from a um, student at, uh, at Columbia, actually, so you're your own mother. Can I talk about a little bit of, like, you know, some of the personal interest initiatives that you've done, you know, you've obviously, you know, within recruiting or diversity, et cetera. How do you find time for the things that you do? How do you find time for mentors? How do you find, you know, what are the things, how do you find time for things outside of work that are actually important to you? Um, it's a good question. It's tough. I think the answer is you have to make time. Yeah. Um, the much like school and everything else, you can always do more. There's always more work that could be done. You can always read more about the next thing or more research or whatever it is. Um, and people in the industry tend to work really long hours and are going to have a similar mindset and be working hard and will always find things for you to do with your time if you get it to right. And so I think the answer is within reason, you need to expect to work long hours, you need to be available, you need to do what's needed. Um, but if there's something that's important to you, then you need to make time for it. And you just should be open and communicate with everyone you work with that you're doing X, Y, Z, and it's important to you and you yeah. want time for it. It becomes easier over time. I think, again, kind of internship, I would try. Um, uh, in kind of your first year, I think I also wouldn't try it hard. If there's something to be said for just developing good first impressions with people. But after that, I think the you have a lot more flexibility and people are people and they have interests too and they do things too and they want to help you out and they're willing to put in the extra time and do the yeah. things to help you out and they expect that you'll do that too. Right, right, right. I think the, the couple, I totally agree with all that. A couple of things there is definitely figure out, I think one thing is go go eyes wide open for some of these careers, like banking, investing, consulting, even corporate finance and even startups. I mean, I, I think I just, listed out 70% of the jobs that people are going to go into, but I, or even in accounting and tax even. 
And so know going in that the first year or the first six months are going to be tough because you're making the transition to become a full-time employee, an actual, you know, uh, you know, in the workforce, so you're, you're not in school anymore. You're learning a completely new industry. You're working with really challenging people, et cetera. So I think it's important to go in, eyes wide open. Look, I think with those first six months, I'm not going to have as much flexibility to do the things that I want to do. However, I think to have longevity in any career that you do and also have kind of balance and all that stuff, it's really important to pick and choose the things that you guys are passionate about, whether it's recruiting, whether it's mentorship, whether it's, you know, sports or staying healthy, you know, whatever, whatever it is that, that is, is for your family, et cetera, and, and do those. And people are generally open to being flexible around giving you the time to pursue that. So I, I would say don't be afraid. If things are important to you to kind of make that vocal, pick the right time and place to do it. But I think ultimately, like, you know, it's it, the, key, the key is to be happy and kind of yeah, and the other thing I have to say is just be aware of the people that you're around. You're working on a team on things in right. cases. That's and what yeah. you choose in the same way that what they choose impacts other people. So you just need to be aware of that and cognizant of that. Yeah. And I think if you genuinely approach it in good faith as a team and you are fortunate enough, and that's why you should spend a lot of time trying to meet people and think about where you really want to work and end up, right. if they are like you and, and are genuinely in good faith, approaching things as a team, then you'll work together and you'll accomplish things, you'll yeah. get it done, and it won't be an issue. If you are just, you know, kind of hardened and like, this is my thing and this is what I do, and I don't care that that means that you, my boss, have to stay up, or you, my colleague, have to stay up right. an extra three hours, you know, in the middle exactly. of the night to do that right. because right. I had to do this, whatever. Yeah. You know, use good judgment and try to be reasonable and practical, and there are certain things like family things that you're just going to do Yep. But there are other things like a hobby or this or that that you can probably make time for, and you can probably do, and you shouldn't necessarily yeah. just give it up. But yeah. just be, be yeah, thoughtful. exactly. I think I think just being thoughtful and being a good team player, but at the same time knowing the things that are important to you. But at the end of the day, the, the job is intense, right? You're being asked to advise some of the largest companies on solving their most strategic problems. So think about a CEO. The, the things that you're working on, you know, for him are the most important thing for his company. So. You know, just keep that in mind as, you know, a lot of responsibilities that you get are because of that, but also note that at times in the client service business, you know, you will have opportunities where you can make trade-offs and, and, and that's the reality of it. Um, so I think, you know, we went through as many questions, I think we went through like 30-ish questions to this call, um, really helpful. I will be in touch with that. Really want to thank Grant for his time. Yeah, and thanks to everyone for listening now, et cetera. And uh, yeah, and we'll be in touch. Thanks again for, for uh, participating.